Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. And a special good morning to our live stream audience around the globe. My name is Julie Miles, and I'm the associate producer for the Mian Forum. The term diaspora comes from the ancient Greek word meaning to scatter about, but in our modern times, it's used to describe any large migration of people, language, or culture. Many of us are immigrants as a result of global diasporas, and we are fortunate that our ancestors took the risk and passed on their stories of their journey and their arrival on Turtle Island. We are also fortunate to the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe for being the past, present, and future caretakers of this land we can all call home today. The land feeds us, shelters us, and provides space for our children to play, and it's on everyone to think about caring for it for the generations to come. I'm gonna move this down, because I can't see. Okay. We will begin with introductions of our guests and our moderated discussion, and of course, leaving some time for some questions from you. You can submit your questions to the ushers on the note cards that have been distributed, and we will get them to the moderator as soon as we can. And for those watching on our Facebook page, you can submit your questions on the conversation feed on this side of your screen. I also wanted to let you know that continuing our partnership with CBC Ideas, our discussion is being recorded today for a possible uh, airing at a later date. And today marks our fourth year partnering with the esteemed Monk School of Global Affairs, part of the University of Toronto. Our season theme is Breaking Boundaries, so it seemed fitting that in our partnership with the Monk School, we talk about boundary breaking in the global sense in a discussion titled Global Diaspora in the Digital Age. Our moderator is a fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs, a distinguished fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation, and a member of the Board of Trustees of the Royal Ontario Museum. She has a long career as a foreign service officer, including as Minister of Congressional, Public, and Intergovernmental Affairs with the Canadian Embassy in the United States, and Ambassador of Canada to the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. And she's a proud member of the Stratford Festival's Playwright Circle. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator today, Deanna Horton. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, on behalf of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, thank you all for coming today. I'm going to bring, begin with brief introductions, and of course you can read more fulsome bios on the website. So Janice Stein, founding director of the Monk School, is known to many of you who have enjoyed her commentary on CBC's The National and TVO's The Agenda, for example. But perhaps you might not be aware that Janice played in a mock benefit for Stratford at the Prince of Wales Theatre in the early 1990s, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Other performers included Bob Ray, Senator Michael Kirby, Hal Jackman, and Jerry Kaplan. She says, suffice it to say, no theatrical agents called. <laughs> John Stackhouse, to my immediate left, is currently Senior Vice President in the Office of the CEO at the Royal Bank of Canada and also a fellow at the Monk School. John was Editor-in-Chief of the Globe and Mail 2009 to 2014 after several assignments as a foreign correspondent. With John's long journalism career, he characterizes himself as an observer. <laughs> I have no doubt that he would observe that newsrooms have made a few improvements since the time of the front page, mm -hmm. Chicago in the 1930s, but few could be the operative word. <laughs> Sida Lu is Associate Professor of Sociology and Law at the University of Toronto. Sida started, studied law in Beijing and then received his PhD in Sociology from the University of Chicago. Although he might have found it difficult to understand the English in Chicago when he first arrived, his experience no doubt helped him when he saw the front page last night. He also just saw Betrayal in New York last weekend, so he will be well prepared to see Merry Wives of Windsor this afternoon. <laughs> so I'm now gonna ask the panel a few questions related to the concept of diaspora and how it relates to the plays this season. We're going to have a discussion, and then we will be turning to you, the audience, to submit very difficult questions to our panel. So I'm going to ask Janice the first question. So the play Birds of a Kind contemplates the life of Leo Africanus, a Moroccan who is captured and given as a slave to Pope Leo X. 
The Pope was impressed by his intelligence and gave him his freedom in return for conversion to Christianity. Shakespeare would have been aware of the story of Leo Africanus uh, in, when he was writing Othello. He would also have been aware that Elizabeth I was promoting trade relations with Ottoman and Moroccan Muslim leaders. Othello the Moor was in service to the Venetian Republic away from his home. Today, from the Palestinians working throughout the Middle East to the Arab fighters in Afghanistan, the, the Arab and Islamic diaspora is rent with divisions between Sunni and Shia and the power plays between Saudi Arabia and Iran. So Janice, how do you expect this is all going to play out? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna let John answer that. <laughs> uh, but you know, just to say a few words um, and not to tell you how it's all gonna play out. Um, it was really interesting as you looked at the history in theater, Deanna, all of those examples were actually written from the perspective of Christians who were looking at Muslims, every single one of them, which is where a lot of the literature that, and theater that we inherited, that's, those are the, the borders of the myth. So in each case, it's about some outsider who, in the best of all possible worlds, converts. Right, that's fundamentally the stories uh, that you were summarizing. Well, if you take that story um, into the Middle East, they do not applaud, uh, is all I can say. This is not a welcome uh, approach. Uh, but there are diasporas within diasporas within diasporas in the Middle East, which is this complex overlay. Yes, Sunni Shia is one divide, but it, and it's an important one, um, but it, it, it's more meaningful outside the region than it is inside the region. It provides this nice, neat frame for looking at the region. Um, here's probably the most provocative thing I could say. Elites from Arab countries in the Middle East don't travel in the Middle East. They stay home, or they go to Paris, or London, or New York, or Chicago, or LA, um, but they largely don't travel. So where are the diasporas in the Middle East? The diasporas in, inside the region are the um, poor uh, people who migrate for work. And many, many of the stories, Palestinians being expelled from Kuwait, are told over and over. These are essentially poor people from the region who cross these boundaries, um, migrate for economic opportunity, and then are the first victims when um, local politics, and all politics is local, when local politics act up. Um, you know, the second comment, I'd love to hear what John thinks about this actually, is um, in, the, in the Gulf area, as distinct from uh, the broader Middle East, tribe is boundary making. So if you're not part of the tribe, you're, you know, you're an other, you're a diaspora, you're from somewhere else, but not from here. So these, we could, if we had four hours as a start, <laughs> we could draw a map of all these overlapping boundaries, one on top of the other, and the space would get smaller and smaller, and those outside would get larger and larger. I think the, for us here, the real challenge is, how does the Western world um, think about um, Muslims who have come from the Middle East? What categories are we using um, you know, in our neighboring province of Quebec, um, we've had some less than illuminating conversations. And where are these conversations most fiercely being had right now in parts of the province where there are no Muslims? So what does that really tell us? So let me leave it at that. This is true. And even for the Brexit vote, a lot of the um, anti-immigrant vote actually came from 
places where there were very few immigrants. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, but how do how do Middle Eastern governments do? Do they try and govern the activities of their people? who are living outside the country. I'm thinking in particular the rift uh, in terms of the Qataris, for example. So there's actually, there's two very different ways that governments tend to look at their people. And again, who's their people? <laughs> who's a citizen, right? Who's a citizen of Qatar? There are extremely restrictive rules for citizenship in Qatar. There are I mean, in Kuwait, how we know it's it's harder to be a Kuwaiti than it is to get Swiss citizenship. Let me just say that. <laughs> All right, and there are you you have to be able to go back in time and prove, and that that's the tribal boundary for citizenship. It's true in Kuwait too, actually. So, how do they think about this? In the best possible world, they're happy for remittances which they all get. So when people migrate largely to the West, uh, they send back money, uh, which is a long-standing diaspora pattern that's been going on for, as John will tell you, for centuries, really. Um, and that's all good. Um, but how do you govern your people when you're actually worried about these people, when they're not you, when they're not part of your tribe, when you see them as subversives, when you see them as potential organizers of resistance and mobilizers of opposition? That's a whole other story. Can, uh, John, I'll get you to jump in, but I, Janice, can you talk about Iran and um, what a digital public square is doing because I think that's a fascinating diaspora story. Well, let me let me just um, Deanna just referred to a oh, let me just say it outright a f absolutely fantastic group of young people that um, we started at the Monk School and is now gone on. Uh, it's called the digital public square just briefly because it's about helping people who can't get into a, a real public square like this, the kind that we have at Stratford, for any number of reasons. Usually their governments want to prevent it. So what can we do to help people like that? And we design really fun, visually um, engaging tools to help people have these kinds of discussions. But let's talk about the Iranian diaspora. Uh, and full disclosure here, I have the most wonderful Iranian daughter-in-law. Um, who just gave birth to the most gorgeous child <laughs> I have ever seen in the whole universe, all right? So just for that as context. Uh, the Iranian diaspora is just enormously complicated and it's layered in history. If we just look at, and, and there are four big centers for the Iranian diaspora, LA, Toronto, Berlin, and Turkey, Istanbul, and that's where the bulk of the Iranians have migrated. And depending on which city you're in, you're, you're gonna get a different picture because it will correlate with the time that Iranians left Iran. So, um, so to generalize across the four is hard, but if I can, these are all mainly people who are not comfortable with the current regime. They are not comfortable with the um, religious strictures that are imposed by that regime. They don't want to live their life that way, many of them. And they left because they were concerned about a closing in of their world. They're, they're, they're very well-traveled. They are very sophisticated. Um, they are expert at using our financial institutions to um, become really global investors um, through many of our Canadian banks. Um, and they are, they are an example of a network diaspora that remain fiercely proud of Iranian history and Persian culture, fiercely proud. Uh, but critical and with a deep understanding of how culture can constrict as well as uh, enrich. John, you want to jump in? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, the digital public square, as Janice said, is, is, is extraordinary. It's a Canadian treasure. And it, it, it is a wonderful illustration of maybe the broader topic that we're discussing here today, which is how our world is transcending geography. Mm -hmm. Our notions of borders and of nation states is really kind of sliding behind us. And we're seeing a lot of reaction to that. And we can anticipate more reaction to that in, in the years ahead of people wanting to literally build walls or figuratively uh, restore or enforce boundaries. It's too late. We have transcended that, as we see in the digital public square, and as we're seeing with diasporas around the world, which can, who continue to enjoy and embrace citizenship, to take their cultures, their values with them. And the challenge is now before us to maybe rethink our approach to international affairs, to diplomacy, to global commerce, uh, through a different lens, less of a geographic lens, which we might have enjoyed and even built institutions around in the, in the, in the 20th century. And in that spirit, diasporas therefore become much more powerful, both positively and negatively. One of the things we as Canadians don't appreciate is that we have a really interesting and significant diaspora of two to three million Canadians living and working around the world mm -hmm. who we kind of ignore or we find amusing, um, but we do not harness for our, our nation's interests uh, or, or for Canada's role in, in the world. Every other major country and minor countries too are, are doing that. So back to the Middle East example, uh, yes, Iran has a very divided, multifaceted diaspora. The regime in Iran tries to use that diaspora mm -hmm. for all sorts of nefarious purposes. But other countries in the Middle East, and I would include Israel in that, are a lot more progressive in thinking about how do we deploy our, di our diaspora to enhance our, our interests. The Saudis are, are uh, very... Um, active on this front as we've seen China. in Canada. China. Well, we, we can go beyond the Middle East to, I mean, China, Singapore, uh, but also uh, countries like Britain actually are very good at working with their diasporas. But back to the Middle East, Lebanon is a fascinating example, which has one of the world's most ancient diasporas. You can't go anywhere in the world without finding Lebanese traders. Uh, and that country, small as it is, has actually maintained a disproportionate role in the world because of its diaspora. So let's go to the second question then, because I think we need to bring China into this. So in the play Birds of a Kind, it is stated, no tribe can stand seeing one of their children leaving for the enemy camp. <laughs> so Siddha, some critics have suggested that the Chinese government is actively seeking to influence members of the Chinese diaspora, such as students, that studying abroad, including in Canada, and the overseas Chinese community. Do you think this is the case in Canada and elsewhere? And if so, how does this affect China's engagement with Canada and with other countries? Excellent question. So um, I think for every topic, uh, there's a good idiom in every culture, right? So for this one, you know, it reminds me of this very old uh, Chinese idiom. Uh, it goes like this, a daughter married outside it's like water splashed. So, so there's a very long tradition in China, actually, if somebody goes away, you know, outside of the family or outside of the country, you're not really part of the family anymore, right? So if you look at, uh, you know, the past two decades, I won't go any further, two decades of how the Chinese government uh, interact with the diaspora, I think there's a really fundamental shift. Because um, until 15 to 20 years ago, I think the Chinese government couldn't care less about the diaspora. I still remember, uh, you know, in the, uh, Diana mentioned I uh, went to Chicago for graduate school from Beijing. You know, when I was graduate from university, I was going uh, abroad for graduate school, you know, um, I think I have to pay back uh, some of the uh, government sub subsidy subsidies for my uh, university tuition. And you, you know, I didn't cancel my hospital re uh, registration, but that was an option. You could just basically cancel your ties with uh, anything uh, in China, and then you just go. The assumption is that once you leave, you'll never come back. Right? And, and the fact is that uh, I think up until the early to mid-2000s, uh, if you're a Chinese uh, student or a, a Chinese immigrant in Canada, in the US, or in some other places, you actually felt very little 
uh, presence of the Chinese government because I mean the only only way probably they interact with uh, overseas students for example when I was in graduate school uh, was uh, through the uh, Chinese New Year uh, uh, party that the Chinese Students uh, <laughs> Scholar Association organized once a year that's it and not everybody goes right so that was the, ca the case about uh, I, I would say up until 15 years ago or maybe 10 years ago and uh, if you can, you don't want to interact with the Chinese government, you don't have to, right? But I think something fundamentally changed since uh, this decade, basically around 2010, 2011, with the rise of social media. Of course, this is a global phenomenon. The rise of social media is changing polit global politics and changing a lot of other things, uh, other parts of our, our lives. And for the case of China, uh, I think the change is even more fundamental. Uh, because um, especially, I mean, I, I'll just give one example. Um, there's this very popular app called WeChat. I don't know how many people in this room have heard of WeChat. Um, it's a Chinese app designed not by the government, by a Chinese company, Tencent. Uh, it became very wildly popular uh, in China since around 2013, 2014. Um, and not just uh, uh, inside China, but also among the uh, overseas Chinese. And WeChat is an extremely powerful app. Uh, it's really hard to put it in the boxes of the apps we have here in the West. It's a, it's a combination, I would say, it's a combination of Facebook, Twitter, Inst Instagram, all yeah. these apps, yeah. and a lot more. You can uh, make hotel reservations, you can uh, order takeouts, buy tra tra train tickets, you can uh, have electronic transactions. Uh, Facebook is trying to promote something called Libra, right? That's a digital currency. It's already there, uh, you know, uh, working. Uh, through WeChat, uh, these apps in China for a few years. So once this app became popular, uh, what happened is that uh, if you're an uh, overseas Chinese person, no matter a student or a, a professional or just a, a Chinese immigrant uh, here in Ontario, for example, uh, you, you realize you actually start to interact not just with the, your family and friends in China, but with a wide range of Chinese media uh, on, almost on a daily basis, because this is the app you actually check uh, many times a day, and you know, not just talking to your friends, chatting to your friends, but actually become a very important uh, news source. And you see this very clearly, for example, in the very recent uh, uh, Hong Kong protest. There are actually rallies uh, here, you know, uh, uh, in Toronto, in Vancouver, in uh, many Canadian cities, both pro pro Hong Kong and pro China rallies. And sometimes uh, they, there, you know, are clashes between them. And if you see how the pro China uh, protesters organized. They actually organize through this app, WeChat, you know, because you know, most of them are on WeChat. They receive a lot of information from it. And of course, there's an, uh, the other side of the story. The Chinese diaspora is extremely complicated. They're not just people uh, coming from mainland China uh, for, for school or for, uh, for immigration. There are also a lot of Chinese uh, diaspora uh, coming uh, from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from other places. You know, they, they, they were outside mainland China uh, before 1949. And there are also Chinese dissidents who moved here after, for example, the uh, 1989 student movement. So many of these uh, different groups of Chinese diaspora, some of them just resist using stuff like WeChat because for the fear that although WeChat is not a government uh, app, it, I mean, if the Chinese government wants to uh, monitor what you're doing on WeChat, theoretically at least, there's a way to do that. No, they, they can they, do it. They actually do that, <laughs> yes. right? Like as yes. our, our uh, research on the monk school actually shows some of these uh, things. So that become a really important concern. And it's influencing not just uh, what's happening in China or how the Chinese diaspora views what's happening in China, but also influencing things like Canadian politics. For example, two days ago on Thursday, uh, there's a Chinese a Canadian man came to my office from Oakville. And he said, uh, you know, uh, they founded a, a local organization trying to facilitate uh, kind of the knowledge and understanding among the Chinese Canadians. I said, why did you find, you know, what's the purpose of this uh, association? He said, it's because he's, he was deeply concerned and worried that the majority of Ch uh, Chinese Canadians in his community actually got most of their information about Canadian politics, about the, no, no matter the Liberal Party or the Conservative Party through WeChat through these Chinese language uh, news sources, which are very different from the globe, or, <laughs> or from CBC. And uh, you know, there are uh, you know, incidents in other uh, uh, parts of Canada too. For example, uh, last year in, uh, in, uh, in BC, 
uh, there's this uh, liberal candidate uh, who actually campaigned on WeChat uh, in, in Burnaby <laughs> South, I think, you know, uh, trying to uh, describe uh, her uh, opponent as, uh, you know, using racist languages. And eventually she, she, she had to quit. But that shows the kind of the power of these Chinese apps, you know, uh, permeating the uh, overseas Chinese community um, and uh, influencing local politics. So interesting. I have so many questions for you, but um, two things that I think are interesting is um, you mentioned about people not uh, uh, use the Chinese mm -hmm. idiom and not coming back, but now there's the the phenomenon called sea turtles, yes. where the government is actually encouraging Chinese to return, yes. and I think that's one way. So I think the influence of the Chinese government has in vastly increased over their diaspora in the past few years. Absolutely. But, but how yes, do you yes, deal yes. with the division? I mean, one of the things that I always worry about when we talk about the diaspora, mm -hmm. we assume um, that it's cohesive. But Definitely not. It's not. And, and you know, I don't know of a diaspora that is not riven with political, internal political differences, yeah. frankly. And what we saw in Canada just a, a few weeks ago in our major cities, with demonstrators in favor of the Hong Kong protesters and largely from the, the Chinese Canadian community and demonstrators opposed to it on opposite sides of, of a line of a barricade in almost all our major cities shows us vividly how divided uh, almost any diaspora community in this city, in this country is when politics so-called at home flare up and create issues. Yes, I, absolutely. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I don't believe there's many, if any, country that has launched a significant return program that has succeeded. Uh, yeah. if you, every country tries it. They, they want people to come back. We've tried. We've tried it. it once people leave, they, 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 they've left, and the challenge is to keep them engaged. Uh, Israel is fantastic at this, has some signs of success, but by and large, most people who have left Israel have left. Tiana, uh, could I ask Tom a question? Taiwan launched a major campaign in the 1980s to get people to move back. Didn't, but didn't people work. people are moving India, back. India has, is, is trying this. There, people are moving back episodically, anecdotally, but not in statistically significant numbers, numbers. and staying. They've well, because, because they've chosen to leave for the most part. So what does and it mean down exploiting your diaspora? You just said, John, earlier, now, we have always failed to exploit our diaspora abroad. So if it's not about moving back, which there's a very, very spotty record here, frankly, for mm -hmm. most countries, what does it mean to exploit a diaspora? So exploit may not be the, 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 <laughs> the, the best word for it, but it, it is to think about the community or communities strategically, that we have 10% of our population, give or take, living and working in other countries who want to remain engaged, who want to uh, maintain citizenship, uh, but perhaps in a different form. And while they may stay, and perhaps second and third generations also want to remain engaged, they can be of greater use to Canada there than here. How? Uh, through their networks. We live in an age of individual networks. Uh, individuals and their networks are more powerful than institutions. So activating them to uh, promote Canadian interests, to connect other Canadians to what they're doing. This is not new. We've got lots of good organizations that, uh, including <laughs> universities, that uh, that strive at this, but we haven't uh, scaled it to the to the two to three million. We're doing it again episodically. So going back to China for a minute, um, how do you think the government? Um, how do you regard how they responded to the Hong Kong issue in terms of looking at it from the perspective of, now I'm saying the diaspora, I recognize that there are many particularly, and it's the same thing with Vietnam. Vietnam has a very di divided uh, diaspora as well. Um, in the case of Vietnam, though, it's interesting, people are going back to Vietnam, I think, and it's the same case with China. You, there are great opportunities for people who have knowledge of the language and of the country who are but who also have a western education and they take a little bit of canada back with them if they happen to have been in canada but anyway i'd love to hear your comments on that yes. i want to make two points uh, first about the return the so-called sea turtle phenomenon sea turtle is kind of a, a chinese term called hai gui basically you go abroad and then you come back you know just sounds like sea turtles that's how where it come from 
But, but it is true that um, you know, what I did just described was like 15, 20 years ago. The assumption is that if somebody goes abroad for education, very likely they're gonna stay there, right? But now there are, I think, 114,000 uh, Chinese students uh, here in Canada, uh, in all, uh, across Canada, different universities. I think some of them will stay, um, and, but some of them will go back. And if you look at the United States, it's similar. There are about probably uh, 300,000 Chinese students in the US. I think you know, probably half will go back, at least. right? Because it's a different uh, time. Because f for two reasons. First, the number of, sheer number of Chinese students uh, in North America is probably 10 times uh, as many as when I was uh, here uh, 15 years ago. But also because the job opportunities the, the Chinese economy, all these things, there, there are a lot of attractions for going back. Same for Vietnam, I think. A lot of the Vietnamese uh, uh, diaspora uh, go, went back to work uh, because the Vietnamese economy is doing really well. And that leads to my second point, which is um, exactly as Diana s said, you can't assume these people, either they stay or they go back, they are of one single identity. Identities are complicated. And some people, if, even if they stay here, you know, become, become Canadian citizens, stay in Canada forever, they, they, they could be extremely patriotic to, uh, to China, maybe even support the Communist Party for the rest of their lives. And there are a lot of people who chose to go back to China, but there's a piece of Canada or the piece of the West, the piece of all kinds of freedoms in them. And when they go back, they will uh, do a lot of things to pursue those, uh, to, to reform Chinese society. And also, it's also important to keep, uh, keep in mind, especially for Canada, I think, there are a lot of uh, Chinese Canadians actually live uh, their lives, you know, in, in both worlds. They spent half a year in China and half a year here. Yeah, that's, right? the br that's what and, we call the bridge. Yeah, exactly. So it's not going back or staying, right. but you, we, we talk about it often, you're on the bridge. Right. You're, you spent part of your time here. You know, John mentioned Lebanese. Um, I think many people in this room will remember an emergency during a war in Lebanon where we, can, the Canadian government discovered that we had thousands of Canadian citizens of Lebanese origin, whatever that means, but that's how it was described, who were at risk uh, in that war. And a fierce debate broke out in this country. Did our government have the obligation to organize a rescue, to remove Lebanese Canadians from Lebanon. Many of them spent 60% of their time in any given year in Lebanon. So we have this across all our diaspora. We now have you know, an estimated 300,000 Canadians in Hong Kong, right. which may be the yeah. most significant Canadian presence in, in, in greater China. And we, don't, I, I would argue, have not adequately thought through what are the consequences right. of that uh, of of that population? But also, what are the opportunities? Because that's a uh, a significant uh, statement by Canada or an expression by Canada, uh, and the Chinese government in Beijing is probably m more conscious of of that population than any other Canadian interest in in Greater China. Uh, so, how do we start to think strategically about, about that, that. Uh, population? be it a, a, you know, as, as a bridge in more ways than, than one. You know, it's, it's stunning. Uh, the University of Toronto, which is our largest university in this country and by far our best. Um, <laughs> by Just far. a small <laughs> advertisement. <laughs> had, so we, we pay, uh, and rightly as we should, pay a lot of attention to our alumni. Well, the largest alumni grouping for the University of Toronto outside of Canada is not in Europe and not in the United States, it's in Hong Kong. Yeah. That is our law. We have 300, I think everybody there must have been a graduate <laughs> of the University of Toronto. <laughs> now, how do you think about this? I think about it as a bridge, frankly, uh, because we, the, the relationships are very deep. Um, and that's a, that is a strategic perspective on a diaspora relationship, which we don't have enough of in this country. That's absolutely true. So I want to give John a chance to talk about diaspora. So the, here's the third question. And all of you in the audience, I hope you're writing down your questions and we'll get them to me soon. Um, so in the 1779 play, Nathan the Wise, <laughs> the powerful but comparatively tolerant leader of the Muslim world, Saladin, declares, in my garden, the trees bear many different kinds of fruit. <laughs> 
in the playwright Lessing's Jerusalem after his encounter with Nathan the Wise. So when we think about the Canadian diaspora, and we've talked about this, uh, estimated close to 10% of the population, it's probably a bit different from other diasporas because it's so diverse. So you've been doing research on the Canadian diaspora. What does it, this research tell you about Canadians living outside the country? And how do you think the government will be engaging with the diaspora now that Canadians living abroad are able to vote? <laughs> it's, a, it, it, it's a great question. Uh, I, I'm just completing a book, uh, which will be out next spring, called Planet Canada. And it's a, a look at our, uh, our diaspora, and Deanna has been of uh, great help to that. Um, but it's, it's trying to elevate the conversation about this population and these communities. And one of the interesting aspects uh, which is growing in significance is this notion of a, of, of a double uh, dual diaspora or a hyphenated diaspora. No country in the world has a diaspora like ours because ours is increasingly looking like the world. It's not uniform, it's not unicultural. And that is becoming uh, an, an interesting strategic asset to, uh, to, to Canada. I had a great session in London with a bunch of millennials, Canadians who had been living in London for uh, a significant period of time three quarters or more of them were what you might call hyphenated Canadians, even though most of them were actually born in Canada, second generation. Uh, Iranians, uh, Sudanese, Somali, Canadians. And they were out there as Canadians, but a very different kind of Canadian. And what an opportunity for us as a country, be it in, in, in London or Mogadishu or Hong Kong, to say we're not just a, 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 a bridge uh, uh, a singular bridge back and forth, uh, we're a multiplicity. Uh, so when Canada is living in your, uh, in, in, in your community, it's actually the, the, the world that Canada is bringing. And that gives us a very significant voice. Some places don't want that voice, but many places, as they're thinking through a more complex world, are happy to have that diversity. Canadians also who are taking on the world or moving out into the world also just have an innate appreciation of diversity. And in our humble way as Canadians, we think, oh, shucks, that's, that's okay. And I would argue we need to start to see this as a serious muscle that many pl places in the world uh, would be happy to have because we know how to deal with the complexities. We grow up with it, the complexities of diversity. And that can be a strength to, uh, to other places and make us more valuable in those places. Interestingly, we're starting to see these conversations in some of the centers you mentioned, Janice, in the Middle East, where Canadians are very active and bring with them that uh, upbringing, that perspective of diversity that some of the more progressive rulers in the region are starting to think, maybe we need a bit more of that thinking. And the Canadians actually are reasonably good in a non-threatening way at that. And we don't need to bring them over because they're actually living here as part of uh, that, that Canadian exactly. community. And they're partly us. I mean, when they live as part of the community, yes, they're partly Canadian, but they're also partly us. And that's the real advantage. You know, let's pause for a second just to talk a little bit more about the vote, which you mentioned, mm. Deanna. That is really, um, I think, a, a game changer that we are, will allow Canadians who are living anywhere in the world to vote in our elections. You know, the government of Italy has done that. <laughs> so you may have seen in some of our federal, in some of the Italian elections, which occur with alarming frequency. <laughs> it's a yearly- They get a lot of practice. They get a lot of practice. It's a yearly activity. You go to an Italian consulate, you line up, you're on the voters' rolls, and you vote. Isn't that a reassertion of the state? You said it's done, it's over, it's done, it's too late. But isn't this the way the state is strengthening its boundaries and actually broadening them? So you're, you're, it, the, the state um, is claiming its diasporas in the world in ways today that they weren't. So I, years ago. I'm not suggesting any end of the state, not, not, not at all. I suggested the state is transcending geography. Yeah. And that's an expression that's right. of that, that yeah. you can live I maybe agree. for decades outside of your country and maintain citizenship and maintain an active relationship with your home country through a number of channels, but voting is a very important uh, uh, channel. One of the ironies in the debate is that 
Canadians uh, abroad have had the right to vote uh, uh, through the 90s and 2000s and largely did not exercise that franchise. The turnout uh, was, was extremely small. Wow. Voting, as we all know, is a, is a habit, yeah. uh, and it's a habit that's best developed early. Uh, so it will be interesting to see if successive governments start to promote this habit, uh, if we encourage people, if we make it easier through mobile or electronic voting, for, uh, for, for instance. Uh, yeah. The desire, certainly in my research among Canadians, to, to maintain that relationship is extremely strong. strong. Yeah. But we have to kind of think of ways to make it convenient uh, or appropriate to to the conditions that people are living in. Uh, you know, I'm sure you all know Democrats, you know, Democrats in Canada, Republicans in Canada, they stay organized yeah. in their political parties. They vote. Deanna knows better than anybody else. They vote in U.S. elections. They, you know, they've lived amongst us for 25 years, dual citizens, but they vote in U.S. elections. And in a sense, they're the wave of the future, not the past, probably. Oh, and, that, and that's a great point, because we like to often, uh, as Canadians, we may look down on Americans as being insular, uh, less global, but with their diaspora, the United States, in a very American way, it's a little yeah. more kind of free enterprise, yeah. uh, is much more active in terms yeah. of harnessing its di right. diaspora and, and allowing partisan organizations, as you've to referenced, function. Janice, to, to promote that is, is an interesting... It is, for them. and it, as you said, John, and, I, and it's true about China too, it extends the American state into Canada when the Chinese government attempts to mobilize its students, which it clearly is doing now. It extends the Chinese state into Canada. So the geographies of states are actually overlapping and expanding in this world. On that note, we already have some questions for you, so let's, let's take a look. Um, and just answer in however you, in whatever order you like. Um, do democratic countries have the flexibility to cope, uh, cope constructing uh, with diasporas, or are they too geographic to adjust? Is the first one. And then secondly, I'll ask a couple, and then you can jump in. In the digital age, does the Inter, uh, does the interest, uh, internet social media facilitate links among the diasporas? Um, China is one example. Discussed how much for other diasporas do the members of the diaspora influence each other through digital means rather than governments? Two questions. Well, I, I would say to the first one, uh, there, there's demonstrable proof that democracies can excel. Uh, at uh, diaspora diplomacy. Uh, we were just talking about the United States. Uh, Israel is a great example of this. India is uh, doing all sorts of interesting things, at working with its uh, diaspora, giving them special rights and privileges, the ability to send your kids to India. There's funding for work terms and study terms for second and third generation Indians. But Ireland, uh, Scotland, yeah. uh, the, the, the French are very good at this. Italian. Janice mentioned the Italians with special seats in parliament for their diaspora. So there's a whole kind of menu of, of options that democracies, thriving democracies, have, uh, have used over many generations to, uh, to maintain that kind of sinew, that connective tissue yeah, with, uh, I, with I, their expats. You know, I agree with John. There's a dark side here, and I just want to put it on the table and maybe we'll come back to it, um, because diaspora communities are very vulnerable. At in, they're vulnerable in Canada when anyone raises the issue that they are being manipulated by their so-called foreign government, right? And that's an old theme in this country. Um, so maybe we just put that one on the table and come back and talk about it afterwards. But I think, wouldn't it be interesting to talk a little bit about Citizen Lab and what it's doing in terms of looking at... Um... Yeah, so let me come to digital media, um, which is something that we do a great deal of at the Monk School. Um, um, and there, there's two pieces to this. One, um, digital media, and John has found this in your research, John, is an absolutely wonderful vehicle for diaspora communities to connect. Um, because it just takes space out of the equation, and it's so easy, and diaspora communities use that a lot. But like all 
like many forms of social media, you get echo chambers, <laughs> right? And so you talk to people who think like you, and your network gets deeper, but narrower as you engage with members of the diaspora who think like you do, and you kind of push to the side and cut out those members of the diaspora from your own diaspora that you don't agree with and whose politics are different and whose religion is different and you get this siloing of diasporas, which is very similar to the siloing that social media um, does more broadly. And we know a lot about how that happens, frankly. So that, that, that's a problem, it's an advantage, but it's also a problem. Um, one part of the work that the Anna just referred to that the Citizen Lab does at the Monk School is look at how governments um, violate their own citizens' rights, frankly, by spying on them through digital means. I, Ron Devert talks about this, it's a wonderful world. We talk about surveillance all the time, but he talks about surveillance, how underneath are citizens being spied upon by their own governments. And I can only say there is very strong evidence that many governments use digital means and use their embassies to spy on especially their vulnerable student populations. Mm -hmm. So even as we in the university community understand how critically important it is for us to be welcomed, to be open, critically important for the future of this country, because right now we are a global magnet for talent, frankly, which is indispensable to our future. Um, and so we are doing everything to welcome international students to this country, and the government's actually cooperating because it's making it easier for students to stay in this country because it's reformed its visa application processes. At the same time as we're doing this, we're not naive to think that our students don't come under pressure from the countries that they have left, and how we cope with this challenge is a, is a big issue how we protect these students. Okay. I want to follow up on what uh, Janet just said. I mean, social media is double-edged sword. I mean, these digital yeah. media platforms are extremely powerful and uh, great for connecting the you know, different diaspora uh, communities. And you know, for example, if you're a, like a Chinese Canadian here in uh, Ontario, you can find yourself kind of easily connected with people in BC or people in Quebec, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, there's a real danger. I mean, there are a lot of dangers, I would say, multiple uh, dangers uh, about the echo chamber effect. Uh, for example, you know, you can, it can easily become platform for uh, racism, xenophobia, all these things, because you, know, you only talk to people you like or people in your own community. And you see that in the US election you know, the, uh, in 2016 very clearly. You also uh, see that in the recent Hong Kong protest. I mean, I, mean, I, I never really realized there's such deep divisions uh, between the Hong Kong and the mainland uh, Chinese sure. uh, Canadian sure. communities here, here until you know these things came up because the, I mean one one I mean there are many reasons of course I mean but one important reason is that they're using different digital platforms. The mainland Chinese use WeChat. People in Hong Kong use WhatsApp and Telegram. Telegram. You know when they when they don't want the Chinese government to monitor what they're doing. Yeah. So so that actually leads to very different and divided communities within the same diaspora, which is you know mm. uh, actually alarming. And, and, and that's, that can become an issue in our own politics, frankly. I can see it playing out in the federal election in some of our constituencies where we have Canadian Chinese um, running for parliament. Right. And all of a sudden it becomes, in that constituency, which side of the divide are you on in this issue? And it reflects, it reflects back. You know, one of the, again, over the horizon issues is, some of these worries and some of these issues will go away when we get quantum computing and better encryption. So it's, for a while anyway, <laughs> harder for governments to spy on us. But they'll break that code eventually. But we may have a window here, of, I hope, I don't know, of 15 years when we take a jump uh, and we can encrypt our technology much more easily and it's just harder for governments to listen in, watch, and see what we're doing because they're doing it, everyone. Absolutely. Um, 
We have a very interesting question here on in the indigenous diaspora. And I was in Australia earlier this year. I was at an indigenous gallery, Aboriginal gallery in Australia, who um, informed me that they had been in touch with some people yeah. in Canada yeah. in terms of um, getting, sharing ideas on marketing and incorporating indigenous values in art, et cetera. So that begs the question, um, how does the global diaspora inform our political relations with indigenous people? John, did, did you do research on that? The, the data is uh, the, the data on our diaspora is 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 not in great shape. So that's one of our challenges as as, as a country. And I didn't come across any data that showed. Um, for instance, Indigenous Canadians, the number of Indigenous Canadians living, uh, living abroad. It's an interesting, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting opportunity for the country as well as for Indigenous communities. But it also speaks to one of our challenges that, despite this robust uh, community that we have uh, abroad, we as Canadians are not great at moving and that would inc include Indigenous Canadians. We don't like to leave our geographies. Um, we don't like to leave our province. Yeah. Uh, and that's true for non-Indigenous as well as Indigenous Canadians. But uh, as we live in a, a more mobile uh, global age, there are certainly interesting opportunities for uh, Indigenous Canadians to spend more significant parts of their lives outside of the country. The question, though, I think speaks to a larger opportunity for the country to use our diaspora to help speak uh, to the world about some of Canada's unique uh, characteristics and foundational uh, principles, uh, which would include our relationship, uh, troubled as it often is, with Indigenous communities. That can be of value to, uh, to countries all over the world. You mentioned Australia. And how do we equip our diaspora to speak as Canadians? So it's not the government of Canada, it's not the embassy speaking, but it's those two to three million Canadians out there who can say wherever they are, here's something you may want to know about our country. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Let me I just one flip to this, because John's right that the data are really terrible, and that's why I started by saying, did you find anything when you were doing the research for your book? Um, but one interesting way some of our Indigenous communities in Canada um, identify themselves is as people of the North. Mm. <laughs> and when they talk about people of the North, uh, it's very inclusive, and there's, it includes a circumpolar region. And they see themselves as um, sharing with other peoples who live in the circumpolar region an identity. Mm. Uh, and those connections and those layers and those networks. So take, for example, um, uh, issues at the, the issue at the UN on Indigenous rights. Uh, uh, Canadian, members of the Canadian Indigenous community worked hand in hand in a circumpolar circle uh, using every kind of network, you know, the digital networks, interpersonal connections, and it was, there was a sense, we are, we are global people, was what um, they said to me. Way more than you Southerners, we are global people. Thank you. It, it, so there is that sensibility sometimes. It, 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 probably another opportunity for us is through students. Uh, we heard uh, the, the, the significant number of international students in the country. It'll be probably over 600,000 yeah. in the uh, current academic yeah. year. Which is uh, really it's, it's, it's a rough estimate, but there's probably 30,000 Canadian students outside of Canada right now. Uh, so we've got a real uh, Im imbalance there. And there's some interesting efforts, including funding in the recent federal budget to help Canadian students or nudge them to, uh, to spend a, uh, at least a term uh, yeah. studying abroad. How interesting to think through uh, focusing that a little more on Indigenous uh, students to spend a term or a year or, or even a full uh, degree or diploma time abroad. Yeah, and, and just to, you know, just to think of one concrete example, our relationship with Russia has gone through a very difficult period in the post-Crimea world. All that, while that's going on officially, and that's what we read about, um, our indigenous community is working very closely with indigenous communities uh, in the Russian Arctic uh, in a seamless way without the disruptions that are going on, either at the government-to-government -government level or at the person-to-person -person level. 
um, in the South. So well, I think, I think that's definitely the power of diaspora. Yeah. I mean, it, it transcends geography, it transcends nations to a lot of extent. So, but um, I'm t I, I have a question about the Canadian fifth column in the United the, States. Um, <laughs> and so double loyalty in general, <laughs> which is, you know, which I, I don't want to walk away from it. Okay. Um, I, it's an old trope, an old song about diaspora, diaspora communities. You, you are, you're loyal to the Canadian government, you're loyal to other governments as well, and, and it's, it's always an insult. It's, it's such a always Canadian mindset, an insult. too, that right. uh, you, you, you hear it expressed in all sorts of different ways, you often do. coded, but it is this kind of questioning, and our expats know this. They know they yeah. are seen by too many Canadians as having left, as, as betraying their country in, in, in some way, and they're out there now doing incredible things, saying, you know what? I am Canadian, 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 and I want to help my country, even though I'm living and working Britain. somewhere oh, else. Oh, yes, I, I think that that is, I mean, the, I, but I find that there's a difference in the Canadian diaspora between those who live in the United States and those that live farther away. Often those who live in the United States don't even necessarily, they fit in so well that they don't even necessarily identify as Canadian. To the, to the same extent, I think the farther away you are, the more likely it is that you really do identify it. And True. also when you are seen as an other where you live. I think that, that's, that's, that's true. That's I mean, they, there's the expression in the US that the Canadians are hiding in plain sight, um, <laughs> or as you said, the, 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 the fifth column. That's changing uh, in my observation. I think a bit of that is because of Trump. Uh, so Canadians are prouder of, uh, of waving their flag. They don't feel like they're second class citizens there. They're actually looked up to uh, a little bit more. Uh, but it's not just a Trump phenomenon. I think Canada and what we're doing in the world is uh, something that more Canadians are, are, um, are speaking out in favor of when they're, when they're uh, living abroad. And we're a little more com confident as a country, which gives, gives, uh, gives them confidence, even, even in the United States. But let me flip Deanna's question a little bit, because we, the, the famous fifth column of Canadian United States, <laughs> Uh, and the United States has a long history. <laughs> you know, most the, the last great outburst was Joe McCarthy of uh, uh, being suspicious of people who are living inside the country, their own country. But you know, uh, let me just talk about a report um, that our national security agencies issued together collectively um, that explicitly said the government of India and the government of China are manipulating. Indo-Canadian and Chinese Canadian citizens in this country, and that is a national security threat to Canada. That's a fifth, that's the old fifth column argument that I've heard so many different times in my life about different communities, including me. So how do we deal with this? Because it can undermine all the values of diversity that we that are so important to us, and yet um, it's naive not to think, and I've seen it up close as a university um, teacher, where students in my class will come and say, shh, but I'm having trouble with my own embassy here. I can't do this. I think one of the approaches is to see the, the, the diaspora as a voice for principles rather than, than policies. And governments have, uh, have, have tried to use diasporas, Canadian governments that is, to promote policies. Uh, there's a, a, an episode uh, going back to 2010 in the U.S. when the Keystone Pipeline was starting to heat up and the government at the time tried to activate the, the Canadian uh, expat community, especially in Washington. We did thinking it they, on NAFTA, on and, the NAFTA negotiations. So it, 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 it didn't work in 2010. It kind of fell, fell on its, its face right. because the community had many different opinions. It was much more successful in, in, in NAFTA because there was a sense of national urgency there. But the real opportunity, I think, is more on the principles side to say that we as, as Canadians, regardless of who's in government, have certain principles that we value and we think are of value to many parts of the world. And I'll cite, cite an example of some really important work that Dominic Barton, uh, who's now uh, ambassador uh, appointed to, to China, but did with Mark Wiseman in the United States on something called long-term capital. Uh, so here's two Canadians in the US who created an organization to help corporate America, the, the, the corporate world more broadly, but the US is where most of the action is on this, get beyond quarterly capitalism. 
And they sensed there was an appetite for this, especially among institutional investors. And Canadians are actually really good at running pension funds, at long-term investing. So they brought in Michael Sabia. And then they said, well, we can't just be a bunch of Canadians telling the U.S. what to do. So they were able to bring in Larry Fink, who runs BlackRock, the biggest uh, investing operation in the world, and a bunch of prominent American CEOs, and say, how do we work together to help corporate America get beyond the, the, the quarter? Millions. This is a work in progress, but to me it's an interesting example of Canadians speaking up for principles, not in an arrogant way, this is not out of any superiority, it just c comes from our approach to capitalism, which is, is not perfect, but tends to be a little more long-term minded than the American pro approach. And it's not uniquely Canadian, Europeans, Japanese, other, other very successful economies also have different approaches. But to work with like-minded Americans and say, how do we help America help itself and bring some Canadian thinking into this? So that to me is an example of focusing on principles rather than a policy and where our governments can get behind these people and say like, you, you, you do your thing. This isn't a government action here, a policy, but we're, we're happy to support you because ultimately Canada's interests are going to be served by something like that. Next question, going back to um, WeChat, I guess. Um, you had mentioned the, the issue about the fellow who came to talk to you about uh, Chinese Canadians and, and the use of WeChat. So um, what do you think, do you think Chinese people living in Canada, I'm speaking of mainland Chinese mm -hmm. now, um, but other groups as well, would they welcome having an alternate? Do they, are people looking for answers when they come to a different country, and this is part of the whole diaspora question and how much you absorb when you are going elsewhere. How do you see that? This is a very good question. Uh, I think it depends on, on, because not all immigrants coming coming through the same path, right? If you look at the uh, mainland Chinese diaspora here in Canada, for example, uh, there are people like me who, you know, came here through education and work, employment opportunities. But also there are people who just, uh, you know, came here for family reasons or because of political persecution, all kinds of other reasons, right? And there are also people who are, you know, fluent in English, can read the globe, can listen to the CBC on a daily basis. And there are people who are, whose English is are not very good, right? So the, the Chinese news sources became their only news source, right? So I think, uh, you know, going, going back to WeChat, my general sense is that the vast majority of Chinese Canadians actually really like WeChat. I think it's a great kind of way to communicate, obviously, and also to get information. Some of them are aware, like the Oakville uh, person who uh, just talked to me uh, two days ago, some of them are well aware and concerned about the potential problems like echo chamber effect, racism, all these problems happening. Um, but I think for a lot of uh, people who are not that uh, political or that uh, are interested, they're happy with using the app for convenience and without actually even thinking about, you know, like what kind, you know, if you actually read these uh, kind of uh, news sources from mainland China, presumably approved by the propaganda department of the Chinese Communist Party on a daily basis, what will happen to you, right? So I think that's really, uh, the concern. So I think my general uh, point is that I think it's important for all of us, not just the Chinese Canadians or you know, Indian Canadians or, or whatever, uh, where you come from, to be aware of the kind of the positive and negative effects and the potentials of these digital media. WeChat is just a kind of a, probably a, a, a uh, extreme example, but it's a it's a very powerful example, right? And the other other things could be become like WeChat in a few years. Like f what Facebook is trying to do, what Apple is trying to do. A lot of their aspirations are replicating what WeChat and uh, some other Chinese app has already done in China. But of course, their privacy concerns and many other legal hurdles uh, here in, in Canada and in North America, they couldn't do that. Right? Yeah. But that's. That's what they're going to, I think. You know, it's really interesting, Celia, because yeah. as you were talking, the history of diaspora communities in this country, if you think back, um, there was always a newspaper in the so-called local language, right? And it was a 
you went to a, there was a great newspaper store in Montreal that had 57 newspapers, all published in Canada, each directed to its diaspora community in its own local language. So this sense that first generation immigrants cling to local language to get news of the home country is a very old, very embedded part of the pattern. So what's different? Well, two things are different. Everybody read the same news. So we had a water cooler effect in the diaspora communities, just like we had in Canada, and there wasn't the echo chamber. And the second thing is the publisher of the newspaper could not spy on you while you were reading it. Right. Right. <laughs> right? Right. And those are the two big differences which make this so much more fraught and raise all these kinds of issues, which I, I, I have to say I worry about because they could threaten the diversity, which is such a critically important part of our future. So the, the Italians created, in some ways, that phenomenon back in the 1890s yeah. when they, they funded newspapers ac across the world. It wasn't just in, in North America. Buenos Aires had a thriving uh, Italian community at the turn of the last century, and they funded newspapers. That funding model continues to this day. The Italian yeah. government continues to fund newspapers, while the Chinese government is funding, I think it's 40 active newspapers in continental Europe. Yeah. You know, Global Affairs Canada, sorry my friend Deanna, but Global Affairs Canada committed what I think is, so I'm glad, I hope this program gets aired. <laughs> committed what I think is a colossal stupidity, uh, colossal, <laughs> five or six years ago when it stopped funding associa uh, associations for Canada studies around the world. The budgetary cost for that was so small. And what it did all over the world, wherever there were people who were studying Canada and Canadians studying Canada or teaching about Canada or writing about Canada, that would form a network in abroad and people would come together and students would get involved. The cost was, it, it, it's a rounding error in the global affairs budget. Um, but, but in the name of economy, it cut that program off as it, at its knees and it's never been resurrected. But if you take seriously John's argument about the world that we're moving into, what an insanely stupid act, right John? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never disagree with Janice. So. <laughs> As my mother would say, cutting off your nose despite your face. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So this, so when we're talking about diaspora and people who have moved, and you know, we're living in a world of displaced people. So we now have, let's see, 70 million displaced persons, 25.9 million refugees. We have people getting displaced all the time. And most people are there for economic reasons or they're traveling for opportunities or education. What about ISIS fighters? So <laughs> here's where you have the question of identity yep. and citizenship that really comes, it, this is where the principles that we were- Jihadi Jack. Yeah. Okay, let's make it very particular. Should Canada repatriate Jihadi Jack because the British broke international law and deprived him of British citizenship. He's a dual citizen. We are legally obligated under international law to repatriate Jihadi Jack. That, that's a very particular case because of that, uh, <laughs> that dual citizenship. It's a hard and case. It, 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 <laughs> but but it's, it, it's almost a singular case because Britain there has the primary responsibility. So there needs to be, the, the Canada uh, probably is doing this, needs to have a, an ongoing conversation with Britain it's too late. about uh, responsibilities they there. The bigger issue that we're at risk of losing sight of is what are the citizenship rights of Canadians who go abroad and get into trouble yeah. deliberately or, or not? Currently, your passport gives, you, gives all of us rights and privileges, including the right of repatriation. Uh, in, you know, there's some ex exceptions, but uh, you, w and, and I think we would all value that uh, if any of us uh, even knowingly committed a crime in another country, we would want the, the, the value of our, our passport if that country didn't have a reasonable rule of, of law to, uh, to, to but what us, about which Syria, which Syria but, does, so let's does not. Let's not make it too easy. Let's make it, let's make it <laughs> a little harder than you just made it, okay? What about 
Canadians. You know, although I, I fear we're, we're, we're always at risk of, of bending uh, and, and losing sight of the bigger picture and disenfranchising a yeah. much bigger population yeah. of, of legitimate Canadians abroad, which is what happened with voting, yeah. because of yeah. the abuses of a few. But right. I'm, I'm not trying to duck the question. I just don't want to lose sight of that, the, the bigger opportunity okay. for us. You're right. Now let's not duck the question. Yeah. Uh, what about <laughs> ISIS Canadians who, women who have had kids who joined ISIS, either because they were 16, 15, 17, and believed that the new world was coming. I mean, very few were coerced to go and join, but they went and joined. They are now in a refugee camp in, run by the Kurds in absolutely abysmal conditions, frankly, and there is a demand that Canada repatriate its citizens. Nothing's happened. So a Canadian is not quite a Canadian here. There's an interesting proposal that was floated by the Macdonald Laurier Institute to create essentially forward uh, justice stations possibly run by the RCMP or some other uh, legitimate entity in, in places like Syria, uh, where there's a concentration of these cases, uh, where Canadian officers, not the consular officers of, 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 of the government, but who, who have a, a knowledge of the law uh, and a reasonable kind of street sense of, uh, of that part of the world, can hear these cases and make a decision of that you just cited, okay, you have to stay here or the conditions are not appropriate for that, we're gonna move you back to, to Canada. It, it, that would require uh, a number of, 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 of changes on our front, but it, I, I find it an interesting approach to coming at this problem from a different angle. Now, would that work I, I think in it's your a mind? total cop-out. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a real cop-out, and, and the reason I think it's an important question, and I wanna push this issue, is what does it really mean to be a Canadian abroad, right? And if you steal a car abroad, or you're in a car accident, and you break the law, of course the Canadian God, so it's gonna come. I've hit a car in Italy. Well, don't ask. I woke up the Canadian ambassador at two o'clock in the morning, and he got out of bed and came to save me from being arrested. <laughs> uh, so, of course, we're gonna do that. But what happens when a Canadian citizen commits a serious crime that raises issues for us about how we're gonna manage that community when they come back to Canada, because that's really what the ISIS issue is. And it's why should we pay to monitor Canadians when they come back because we're worried that they're an ongoing security threat. Secondly, and that's why I think that McDonald Laurier proposes a cop out, the argument is we will never have evidence that will, with, that will be strong enough in a Canadian court to prosecute these people. Well, a forward justice station doesn't solve that problem in any meaningful way. So we're just making a decision on the fly for some people who we worry will be security issues in this country should they come back. A Canadian is not a Canadian. We're voting with our feet. Do you think, do you think this is just a challenge in Syria? Because no. of all, and, yeah. and with, it's, with ISIS? Yeah, I think it's ISIS. particular to ISIS and to Syria? Well, I, I don't think it's only a, a, you know, a problem with ISIS. That's why I think Deanna's so right to raise it. It's in front of our face with respect to ISIS. And we, we're, you know, that's why I'm trying to make it hard. Women and kids. Um, there are kid, Canadian kids, four or five, who are dying of malnutrition in this badly run camp, which is no fault of the Kurds because they have no resources, and our government is just saying, stay away, stay away. We don't want you, Canadian, back in this country. Well, on that note... Um, you raised it. I did, I did. But I want, I want to give Sid, I have a very, I have a question, uh, final one, which is the people, who, the sea turtles, mm -hmm. what impact, so this is the diaspora who has returned and either to China or to Hong Kong, what influence do you think the sea turtles will have? I think they will actually make significant differences in uh, not just in their own work, in their lives, or in the general social change, but also even in the digital media. I think a lot of very innovative uh, high-tech companies in China, for example, were actually founded by these sea turtles. And you, you can see the same thing in Hong Kong. A lot of uh, 
financial professionals in Hong Kong were actually trained here, you know, and then, then went back. So I think these people are, like Janice said, are bridges. They're playing very important roles to, uh, for every country, but especially, I think, for the case of China or, or Russia or these more authoritarian regimes, I think they actually carry more burden and responsibilities of helping these places become more open-minded and you know, less oppressive right, in the long term. But of course, if you look at the sheer number, I mean, uh, the so-called sea turtles, the returnees uh, to, uh, to these countries are still only a tiny fraction uh, of their total population. And they concentrate, tend to concentrate in the big cities, the East Coast, you know, all these Shanghai. kind of, yeah, yeah, Shanghai, Beijing, Hong Kong, uh, these places. So, so to what extent they can actually, I mean, there's spillover effect, I think, to the, the vast territories of uh, other parts of China or, you know, other places. I think that's a, a question for the long term. But I am optimistic. I want to end with an optimistic note, uh, which is, you know, these things take time. But I, I do believe that um, in the long term, technology will do more good than harm you know, for, for the returnees and for the more generally the, uh, different kinds of diasporas. Okay, well, I think we've had a very interesting conversation today and I wanna thank everybody who gave us such great questions and uh, thank you very much to the panel for coming to Stratford and, and participating in the wonderful Me Inform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janice, John, Sita, and Deanna for sharing with us today and also for, uh, and for giving us some optimism as well. So thank you so much. Um, the forum continues into the fall with inspiring guests and opportunities to immerse yourself in our work. Next Saturday morning at the Avon Theatre, Artistic Director Anthony Chimilino sits down with former Governor General, the Right Honourable David Johnson, to discuss his new book, Trust, 20 Ways to Build a Better Country. And it also gives me, it's, we're very excited, it's an added, added event on Thanksgiving weekend on Sunday, October 13th. Company member and lyricist Marion Adler will discuss writing musicals with her longtime friend and award-winning composer of The Little Shop of Horrors, Alan Menken. Our members of our company will perform some excerpts from their new musical, and they'll also discuss uh, how they wrote this musical together, Little Pinks. Thank you again to our guests. Thank you to our live stream audience around the globe, and thank you to our studio audience for your continued support of the Mian Forum. Thank you. Thank you.